Welcome. So glad to be with you tonight and so lucky and feeling so fortunate to be with Glenn Grossman. As you know, Glenn Grossman is an epidemiologist with over 20 years of experience. While pursuing his doctorate in epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, Glenn Grossman served as an epidemiologist on staff at the UNC Infectious Disease Clinic for two years and taught epidemiology and advanced analytics at Duke Medical School and at UNC. He has been involved in epidemiology forecasting and advanced analytics with Bristol Myers Squibb, Sanofi, Novartis, Medicare, Medicaid, Veterans Health Administration, Military Health Service, the CDC, and other programs within the United States and abroad. All views expressed today are his own. Thank you to everybody who has submitted great questions for our conversation tonight. And thank you to everybody who, and if you have questions, as I had mentioned, if please send them via the chat box at the bottom of the screen. And let's jump in. Glenn, please update us on the COVID-19 pandemic, variants of concern, how are things going regarding the vaccination in the US and abroad? And bear with me one moment as I mute our participants. Thanks. Thanks, Rebecca. I'll go ahead and get started. All right, let me share my screen. Okay, here we go. All right, um, let me put this down. So um, where are we? Let's look at the United States first. All right, so there's a few states that still have uh, high community what? transmission where they're either high or increasing. Um, and so, uh, yeah, Rebecca, if you can mute the others. Um, or anyway, so there's, there's a few states. And this is completely surprising because this is summertime. So we shouldn't be having increases in, um, in spread anywhere. And, um, and pl plus, I, I mean, generally, plus the vaccinations have been kicking up speed. So we shouldn't, you wouldn't expect higher transmission rates. However, the fact that there are higher transmission rates, there's increased hospitalization uh, this past week over previous weeks in around five states um, is indicative and it, rep it really represents that the um, variants of concern, particularly the Delta variant, uh, is is starting to pick up speed and is is worrisome. All right. uh, Rebecca, if you can uh, uh, mute everyone except me. All right. So now this is this is the spread. Cases cases are are uh, have gotten low across the board, but there are still again some states. Uh, you can see Arkansas, Missouri, uh, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, and Nevada that are still um, have have higher levels than than we would expect. In fact, it's most interesting, this is at the state level. The problem is when you look at the state level, it really hides a lot of information because there, there's variation within the states. So I, I like looking at it within the county level. When you look at the county level, you see that a lot of states are, are doing okay, but some states, even if they're doing okay in some places, have a bunch of these hotspots where there's a lot of cases that are spreading. Um, and so you see that that it's just weird. Uh, most likely in these places, it, again, the Delta variant that's starting to really pick up. But the problem is, if we have these hot spots in some places, will it start spreading to the areas around that? And in fact, so this is right at the county level looking at total cases. Um, if you look at this map, which I really like a lot, this combines the caseload and then also the test positivity rate among um, unvaccinated people. So if you're unvaccinated in any of these counties, what's your risk? And you see that there are some counties in particular that are extremely high risk for unvaccinated people. It's the end of June. So this is really not what we were expecting, uh, particularly because we have these great vaccines available, but it is what it is. Um, you see some states have more of these counties than others or more of the population in these counties. But frankly, if it's in some of these counties or hotspots, then they can spread to the surrounding counties. You see that there are some areas that are green that are in really good shape where they have both a low case load and a low um, uh, test positivity rate. Uh, so that's great. Um, but, but, and, and the, and the uh, higher vaccination rate also will make it green. But, um, 
but so this is this is worrisome. And so the question in the United States is what happens from here? All right. When you look at the um, let's see. So so this is all I wanted to look at here. Next, let me go to vaccination rate. All right, so you can see that some states are doing particularly well. I'm looking at people here. I'm most interested in fully vaccinated. The reason being that with the new variant of concern, the Delta that we're all talking about, um, Delta really one dose of the mRNA vaccine is not enough. It's only around 30% effective with one dose. So previously we had talked about um, the mRNA vaccine being around 50% protective against the original variants. But now with this new Delta variant, it's only around 30% protective. So it's not very protective at all. 70% of people who got the first shot and never went back for the second shot uh, are candidates to get severe disease as if they don't have any protection. 70%, that 70% is a lot. Um, among the second people who received the second dose, uh, it's around 80% protection. So 20% uh, of people, give or take, um, on average across the population who have gotten the mRNA vaccine will be protected with the current Delta variant. The Delta variant is still mutating. And so who knows what it will look like in November in the United States. Um, but for now, this is what we're looking at. The problem is that we'll get into in a little while is that the protection amount varies by a bunch of different things, including age, including other things. And so even though we're talking about an average, there are subpopulations who will have an even higher risk level than the 20, than the 80% protection would suggest. And so that's where it becomes worrisome because if the higher risk is among specifically people over the age of 65, people with comorbidities and things like that, then we might see another big surge like we had um, last uh, fall and winter. All right, this is vaccines. I can look at it at the county level too. Um, here's vaccination rate. You see that there is wide variation. Even within some states, some areas have a, a high vaccination rate, whereas other counties have a much lower vaccination rate. Um, and so it's really uh, problematic. Um, some states are doing much better than other states uh, in terms of vaccinating the population. Um, and so, so this is really gonna be problematic. So for instance, when we look at um, the percentage of the population, I think total population is fine. You see that um, Alabama, Mississippi, um, they're at like 35%. Mississippi here is 35% uh, of the population vaccinated. That's not a lot of people. Whereas the one that's doing the best right now, Vermont, has 73% uh, of the total population vaccinated. So Vermont is setting itself up for much more success come fall and winter. Um, in fact, uh, one thing I can put here, well, we'll talk about it later in one of the questions. But, but so this is, this is something we're going to need to be paying attention to. Uh, the, vac the vaccines only work among the vaccinated. And, uh, and there's wide disparity in, the, in who's getting vaccinated, where are they getting vaccinated, et cetera. All right, um, that is the US. Let's jump to the world. All right, so here is the world at a glance. Um, as we've mentioned previously, let me see if I can move this. Um, this is this, uh, the COVID-19 is a seasonal virus. Uh, we know this at this point with, with high confidence. Um, it looks like it's, it's following the same typical seasonality as cold and flu season, uh, in, in particular pneumonia. So the seasonal patterns of pneumonia, this is fitting very, very closely with globally. Um, and so we're in, in the United States, it's no longer cold and flu season, it's no, no longer pneumonia season. And so our caseload would be expected to be a lot lower. Um, despite the fact that that's weird that we're seeing, uh, like I said, in five or more states uh, where we're not going down right now, where it's actually going up. Um, in, the in the Southern Hemisphere, where they're approaching winter now, um, you see that there is a rise. Um, they've been doing pretty poorly. Like Brazil, when we look at this, um, when we look at how Brazil has been doing, um, They've, they've been doing very poorly for a while now. Um, and it's just been ongoing. It's really been very, very poor management in the country. 
Um, they have not been vaccinating enough. Their policies have not been good. And, and so there's just been this constant uh, burn essentially in terms of who's getting it. Now, one thing I wanted to point out here was sort of the distinction between the United States and United Kingdom. So interestingly in the UK, this is the vaccination rates. So that the percentage of the population who are completely uh, vaccinated. So I've gotten the two doses. So let me, let me, in fact, so this is one dose. One dose, if you recall, um, UK took an early, uh, an early uh, decision to try to vaccinate majority of people with one dose first to give them some protect, protection. And that's when you compare the United States to United Kingdom, the UK really had the sharper growth curve of people who had one dose. And they still to this day have more people that have one, had one dose. But what's more, we're most interested in with the Delta variant is people fully vaccinated. And even among people fully vaccinated, over the last week or two, you can see that the uh, United Kingdom has a higher percentage of people who are fully vaccinated. All right, and so this is important because right now, UK is in, is in a significantly better position than we are, because not only do they have more people who are fully vaccinated, they also have a lot more people who have had at least one dose, so they're much closer to getting the second dose than we are. Um, and so as a result, you'd expect UK, especially that summertime, it's season out seasonally, you'd expect the UK to be in really good shape right now. And that's why when you look at this curve, they are having a surge over there. Um, the Delta variant uh, got a head start in the UK. Uh, and so it's been, uh, it's been traveling around. Uh, and so I'll, I'll jump into this a little bit more, but basically you see that they're having a summer surge. So the question for the United States that is still an open question is, will we see a summer surge like we did in the South and West last year? Will we see it again in the South and West this year? Remember, if we recall this, the summer surge in the South and West, I don't have a big graphic here. It didn't begin until around July was when we started to see it. And so right now there's no evidence that we're really seeing that. Um, there, there's give or take, there's some things that could be suggestive of a very, very early indicator, but it's still too early to really tell. But come July, it's still an open question, I think, if, if in some states we'll see a summer surge. But what this means to me is regardless of what happens in summer, this is suggestive that it's increasingly likely that come fall and winter, it's going to be hard to avoid a surge, a, another surge in the United States, uh, even with our vaccination rates. Just because when you look at look here, you look at the UK and just these basic things. We've talked about other countries as well. Um, so first, we we talked a, a month or two ago about Seychelles uh, in the Indian Ocean, which was the first evidence that this was uh, something we might need to worry about. UK is a much more sophisticated, a larger country with a much better infrastructure. They're using uh, the, the um, uh, great vaccines. They have, they've been using both the AstraZeneca vaccine uh, as well as mRNA vaccines. And, and it's not as effective as we, as, as we had hoped. Um, I think right now, so let me, let me jump into this a little bit. All right, oh, before I do, let me, let me jump, look back at the US. So we talked last week about the percentage, how common is the Delta variant, and it's also called B1617.2. So we looked at the end of May 8th, uh, it was 1.3%, and then it jumped two weeks later, roughly, to 2.8%. And so the question is now, what's the most recent reading? So this was 2.8%. Now the most recent reading is it's jumped from 2.8 to 10%. And so it's growing exponentially. Right now in the UK, uh, the doubling rate is around eight days. And so that's approximately what we're looking at here too. Um, and so certainly by the end of summer, it's, it's uh, oh, not certainly, but extremely likely that by the end of summer, the Delta variant is going to be very, very common, uh, the, m more common than, than perhaps even all the other variants. Um, here's the map. So this is at the end of May, by the, the week uh, or two week period ending May 22nd, this, Yellow was the UK variant, which itself was around 50 to 70% more contagious than the previous variant that we had back in fall winter, this previous fall winter. Uh, this, it was the uh, UK variant is 50 to 
more contagious. And the Delta variant is now around 50% more contagious than that. And so here's the week ending May 22nd. And then two weeks later, if you, if you look, the brown, the, the, the small brown uh, slivers are the Delta variant. And so you see that it's in some places, not very much, but it's this brown sliver. Here it is, the week ending uh, June 5th. You see that the brown sliver has become a pretty big chunk in many parts of the country. In some parts of the country, it's still a somewhat small sliver, but other parts, uh, it's, it's rapidly expanding on, on the, the country. Um, so this is something, it's, um, it's, a, it's an open question right now, whether again, whether we have the summer surge in the South and, and West like we did, or whether this is just something that we're, it's gonna just hit us when, when uh, we we're looking at fall and winter. Here, here's another view on this. So this is the, um, it's a little bit unclear. This is from GIS aid. Um, and it looks at the UK, or rather the, the Delta variant as it's uh, growing as a percentage of the other variants. So you can see Arizona, California, this sharp purple line is the Delta variant. Oh, in fact, let me move that over. So it's 6.1, it's previously called B1617.2. So it's this pinkish purple that you see there that's straight up. It's Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida. It's everywhere in every state. It has the same curve. The only reason that there's different percentages when we, when we look at it on the map is that some are further along on this curve than others. So for instance, some, the curve started earlier. In other states, the curve is starting later. But in all places, the slope of the curve is, is virtually identical, as you can see. Um, and so uh, I live in New Jersey, and here we are. It's 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 uh, exponential growth rate here that we're looking at. So um, so this is the Delta variant. So now let's go back and just look. I just wanted to touch on UK a little bit more because UK was was uh, fur further ahead than we are, and so they're they're having the surge right now. So when you look at the UK variant, blue this blue color is what the Delta variant is. So you see that they were doing. Uh, they, they had actually a shutdown in December um, and even before the UK variant started getting big. The UK variant is this uh, B117, so that's this green. It, become, it became very, much more common in December, uh, middle of December to early January. This is what caused the shutdown. It quickly uh, overwhelmed all of the other variants and became the dominant variant. But you see, despite how contagious UK variant is, the blue, the Delta variant, is even more contagious and is now becoming, uh, it's hard to tell because the gray area is most recent data where the, it's noisy. Uh, and so it's a little bit unclear, but you see that it's rapidly becoming uh, the dominant uh, uh, variant in the UK and it's really driving the surge. Um, when you look at some more data, this is what's, mo what, what's uh, more interesting. So I wanna dive in here a little bit more. So when you look at the increase in cases, the, the growth rate is roughly the same growth rate as the autumn wave was, uh, with the UK variant, the daily but but daily admissions to hospitals is not quite the same for a few reasons that we'll get into, um, and the total number of patients is not quite the same. So, but the daily admissions is the key thing here. The other oh, and this is uh, Northwest England, um, Northwest of England. When you look at England as a whole, which is down here. So the current wave. Here, it's following this virtually the exact same path in terms of an exponential growth. Daily admissions are, again, not going up very much, uh, although it could be delayed. Total patients also consistent with the daily admissions. The death rate uh, is, is a little bit noisy, but it does not appear to be going up at the same rate that they did, which is good news. Uh, and, and so for now, this is still a question. But so when you dig into this a little bit, let me close this up. So when you dig into this on the next slide, what you'll notice is the key to, a key driver here. I don't have a good slide on the other thing, but right now it's mostly the 18 to 64 year olds that are driving the current wave. Um, when you look at people 65 to 84, it's pretty flat. They're not really increasing right now. Among people age 85 and over, it was flat and decreasing. Although in the recent few days, it looks like it's starting to be going up in this uh, age group. Um, and so really what's going on is likely that these people were probably the, the uh, ones who are still unvaccinated. 
And so it's probably largely among the unvaccinated that's driving the surge. And so when you think about this, in fact, let's go back here for a second. So when you look at the surge here, this is surge in cases. I'm gonna get rid of Brazil for a second. So this is the surge in cases, not deaths. I wish we had uh, a way of looking here at hospitalizations in uh, in UK, but I don't think that we do yet. Oh wait, hospitalized patients. This is new. Um, so hospitalizations has not, it's rising maybe a tiny, tiny bit, but it's not significantly rising. And so this is largely due to this idea that it's, it's the lower age group who tends to be at lower risk in general of severe disease. And so, and so when you look at hospitalizations, it's reflected also in the death rate that the UK death rate is not going in. Now, when we meet again, we, I think we discussed that we are not gonna meet in two weeks because it's July 4th weekend, but in three weeks when we meet, that this will be the critical thing that everyone's gonna be talking about and looking at. Will we, or rather, will the United Kingdom be in worse shape where there's an increase in hospitalization and death based on the surge? Or will it mostly be a surge of cold symptoms among people who are unvaccinated? And that's the big question. And so we're all going to be looking at it. Because if it's just a surge of cold symptoms among the unvaccinated who are younger and lower risk, then really we don't have to worry. Like even in the fall and winter, this is not something we're going to have to worry about then. But if it begins with the unvaccinated and then the unvaccinated start spreading it more and more to people who have previously been vaccinated and they start to get severe symptoms and hospitalization, then that could be just a delayed effect that we might see. And that's what, that's what some of us are expecting. Um, so. Glenn, can I, can I just jump in right there with a, a question from our audience? Rachel, if you could unmute and ask your question about the, the vaccinations. Sure, thanks. Um, question about the non-mRNA vaccines and the effectiveness against the Delta variant. I know that you said for those that received the mRNA vaccine, vaccine it was 30 for one and approximately 80 for two. What do we know about those other vaccines like J&J &J and AstraZeneca with regards to Delta? Yeah, so we still don't know enough. It's, it's not as good as the mRNA vaccines right now. Um, I saw this, here it is. So this and wait, is- from, Sorry, one quick follow on to that when you're done. Would that would there be any precedent then for people who received the non-mRNA vaccines to get the mRNA vaccines? Sorry. Yes, so um, yeah, let me, let me answer that question first. Um, so basically there have been some clinical trials looking at cross uh, vaccination. So you're starting with one brand or, and, or, or one uh, type of vaccine and then switching to another vaccine for a booster shot. And it turns out, in fact, I have a slide on this. It turns out that that actually prov provides better coverage. Uh, here it is. So it actually uh, is be more beneficial to actually switch over than to get two of the same. And so, so this is something that I uh, expect that uh, other countries and maybe even the United States are, are going to do more of. Uh, I don't know yet if there's going to be a booster shot in the United States. It's still early, for, so it's still June. And right now we're talking about these variants, but come November, there may be other variants that are even worse that we have to be talking about. We just don't know yet. Um, and so the Delta variant, all the, the variants don't just stop mutating at any point. They're continuing to mutate as long as people continue to get infected. And so, um, I mean, the way evolution works is just a, a selection pressure is that the ones that are able to escape the vaccine then are rewarded by being able to have more offspring and being able to replicate. And so they have, so those accumulate and that's how you get more and more of the spread of the ones that can immune the vac, uh, ev evade the vaccine. So typically the ones that are more contagious or the ones that are able to reinfect patients or the ones that are able to uh, break out of the vaccines are the ones that are the uh, most rewarded uh, in terms of having the most offspring in the game of evolution. And so, unfortunately, this is the, what we're what we're working through right now. Um, but going back to your other question, so in terms of the efficacy, this is I like IH, IHME uh, in terms of their attempt here. The uh, empirical support for this 
roughly is uh, based on this. They, they, they sort of estimated this based on some real world data that they had, but in terms of the published studies, it's the, not quite as robust as, as some of the data that they're providing here. Um, but you can see when you look at Moderna, um, this is the B1617 with the Delta variant. It's actually, there's actually multiple B1617s. In particular, the Delta variant was B1617.2. Um, and so it's unclear if this is all B1617 or just, it looks like this is a combination of P1, which I think was Brazil, B1351, which I think was South Africa, and then the, the B1617, the Delta variant. Uh, B117 was the UK variant. And so what you see uh, is that the RNA vaccines, this is Moderna and, and Pfizer, are roughly 89% of preventing disease. For me, this, so there's two important parts of the vaccine. One is preventing disease, because for sure, that's one of the main reasons we get the vaccine, to prevent people from getting severe disease, from being hospitalized, and from having increased mortality. However, the other thing that we need to discuss is also preventing infection. Because if someone who's vaccinated only has cold-like symptoms, but then continues to infect people around them, then that's problematic. Because that means that uh, the whole idea of herd immunity, for instance, is that people who are vaccinated or previously infected can then be a wall that protects people who are unvaccinated around them. But if the vaccinated people themselves can then get infected and infect others, then that's really problematic. Right now, we're looking at around 15% uh, can get infected, um, and it, it might even be larger across different age groups. So for instance, people who are over the age of 65 uh, might be more, whoops, pardon me. All right, I'm back. Glenn, we lost your video. Oh, you're back. Oh, I'm back, I'm sorry about that. All right, um, and so, so let's see. So here's where we are. Yes, and so one more, and so then when you look at the, uh, on the table here, it represents all of the approved vaccines in different parts of the world. So the other ones that we're looking at uh, here, so I don't know that Novavax is approved anywhere, it just finished its clinical trial, but the other ones that we're looking at here are uh, Johnson & Johnson, it also goes by the name Janssen. Um, this one is approximately 64% effective uh, uh, based on these. So the Delta is probably 64%, uh, but then, 57 percent, not not too different than than half, um, are are can still infect others even despite the fact that they've been vaccinated. Um, so again, the two things we want to prevent severe disease and hospitalization, but also want to prevent people uh, infecting other people. And this is this is for me is what I see is driving the surge uh, come the fall and winter. Um, all right. What a couple of other things I wanted to just talk about here. Let me see if I can jump through it real quick. Um, yeah, so this, I wanted to touch on this. All right, so, so, so here's one other thing. So the RO, the R0, was the estimated number of people, essentially how contagious the virus was before there were any uh, attempts to stop it from spreading. So before we started wearing masks, before the lockdowns, before social distancing, before everything, a pro how contagious was it? And the way that this estimate is reported is on average for every person who's infected, how many people do they infect? And so there were a range of estimates for a variety of reasons, but in the United States, the CDC ultimately decided that the best estimate of the original Wuhan variant, not the new variants, the original one uh, back in March and April of last year of 2020 was around 2.5. It uh, went from two to four, but the, their best estimate was 2.5. We have a lot more information now, and this is what I wanted to just jump into real quickly too. So it varied dramatically by state. So for instance, in New York, which got hit really hard, on average, every person infected there may have infected as many as five to six other people, closer to five other people. Um, whereas in Alaska, on average, any one person infected there only infected one other person. And so they did not have exponential spread at the beginning because one person just infecting one person, you could go for many months if it stayed that uh, as contagious as that without having an epidemic. It would go very, very slowly. Um, 
when you dig into this a little bit more, so there's other estimates too. This was from RT Live. It's one reasonable estimate, um, but there's other reasonable estimates too. This one was from um, COVID-19 projections. They estimated that it was between three and four uh, in New York here and less in some other places, but there is wide variation based on the town. So for instance, it's a little bit hard to see this, but here's New York City. New York City, pretty much every estimate I've seen has suggested that New York City was the most in the country. It's very densely populated. People were going on the subways. They were, there were tight offices, uh, office spaces, tight residential areas, very small buildings. And so as a result, uh, one person in New York City on average infected five to six other people. And so when you look at other places around there, here's Westchester was also very high, Pennsylvania, some places in the country, there was just a lot more spread. Again, this was before mask wearing, before social distancing, before all of the things we implemented. If we're talking about getting back to normal, then that means we really need to be looking at these r nots and not the current r nots because as people start commuting back to work and taking the subway again, and people have started taking off their masks because we heard the, uh, the uh, guidance from the CDC, then in the fall and winter, when this comes back, um, where it's gonna be contagious again, uh, probably to a high level. So now again, this is the Wuhan variant, the original variant. Now, if we're talking about uh, the, the UK variant being 50 to 70% more contagious, and the Delta variant being 50, another 50% 50 more contagious than the UK variant, then we're really potentially looking at a contagious virus that's two to three times as contagious as what we had back in March and April of 2020. So that's why this is so worrisome, because what this means is that instead of an RO of five that you had in New York City, now potentially you have an RO over 10. And so when you're talking about the unvaccinated group, this means that it's going to be very challenging not to get it. Uh, and so this is something that, this, this is why I'm, that this is why every epidemi virtually every epidemiologist, not every single epidemiologist, but the vast majority are assuming we'll have a surge. The big question is whether it will have a large number of hospitalizations that follow or whether it will just be mostly cold symptoms. Um, I think that my personal view right now, it's June, and this is just tentative. I'm not putting a, a strong uh, 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 foot down on this yet, but this is where I'm starting to think more likely than not is that we, when we see a surge of the virus spreading a lot in the United States, if we don't start to put the masks back on and physically distance widespread around the country, then because this variant is so much more contagious, um, I think it's going to be hard to avoid reinfections and people who are vaccinated starting to get uh, infected and getting severe symptoms, particularly people over the age of 65 and whatnot. It's not going to be as bad as some of the uh, uh, outbreaks that, or the, rather the surges that we've had previously, uh, I don't think because the vaccines are so effective. And we also do have this uh, possibility of, of getting boosters. Um, but just when you add the math up and do the and look at the the the, uh, the math itself, um, the light the, the opportunity is there that it could it could be worse than than what we're thinking. The one other thing that we're looking at here is that this is the uh, variation in countries around the world. I know it's a little hard to see. The big thing, my big takeaway from this slide is not how any particular country did, but that there's variation. And so we saw early on that some countries seem to be doing better, some worse. And a lot of people were making policy recommendations because they said, oh, look, Sweden is not doing this or some country is doing this policy. But really, if an R naught is small, the country like, like it was say in Croatia or Cuba, they really didn't have to do much. Their policies could be very, very ineffective but just slightly effective in order to get it below one. And if you recall, one is the magic number where if the R is less than one, if on average everyone infected, on average infects less than one other person, then that means it will automatically go down on its own. And so uh, there's huge variation. There's probably gonna continue to be huge variation, 
but the Delta variant just kicks it up a notch everywhere and just makes it much harder because now countries need to do a much better job of implementing effective policies uh, because there's not as much wiggle room here. Country, like I said, countries that were closer to one before really didn't have to do a very good job and they and they could be, it could be good enough. But now that the Delta variant is here, countries, it, it's not good enough to just barely do anything. You have to, they, we, there's gonna have to be a much stronger level of intervention. So, all right, Rebecca, let's open it up to questions. Oh, goodness, Glenn. All right, better that we should be informed, right? And that we hold on to the masks. Right. Although, right. you know, having said that, I do think that this coming fall and winter may likely be the last hurrah, um, simply because by the time we're this time next year, it's going to have gone through the population at least once. Some people will be reinfected. But the amount of immunoprotection to a wider diversity of variants will have been really maximized at that point. And so I think that it's good. And I think not just in the United States, but probably globally at that point, we're really going to have so many people who have either gotten the vaccines or been infected that it's just going to be hard to see in the year or two after that we're really going to have any big surge after that. If you recall, I've said previously that the flu of 1918 um, never actually went away. In the first year or two, there were several surges and then it sort of died down for a while. But whenever we talk about anything at talking about the H1N1 variant or, or HXNX, anything that starts H and then N, that's the flu vac uh, virus is actually a, a descendant, a variant of the original 1918 flu outbreak. And so uh, it's still around with us today. The avian flu, swine flu, all these pandemic or epidemic flus are actually variants. So hopefully we'll continue identifying next generation vaccines and treatments so we can maybe at some point eliminate it from the world. But, um, but I think the, the big hurrah of the pa global pandemic, I think this next fall winter is probably gonna be uh, the, the last hurrah for a while, but we'll see. <laughs> All right, so we're, we're speaking a lot about those who are vaccinated, those who are unvaccinated, and we have still a significant part of our population that simply doesn't have access to any type of vaccine simply because there isn't a vaccine, and that's the population that is 12 or under 12. And so do you have any advice for how to navigate the summer safely. Lots of parents out there are wondering what to do, how to protect their children now that schools are, you know, school is ending and now we're moving into the summer and there's still no emergency use authorization. There's no vaccine for these children. What to do with the children? Yeah, that's a really good question. So. I, I like this summary that uh, epidemiologist Caitlin uh, Jettelina put together. And so I'll, go, I'll just spend a few minutes going through this. Um, so basically it's best to talk about these things in terms of risk tolerance. So some people may have a bigger risk tolerance and so a higher risk tolerance. So maybe they'll be more comfortable with kids doing some of these red activities. Whereas some people might have a medium and some people might have a low risk tolerance in which case they would only allow the kids to be exposed for these different things. So let me go through them just so people can see. All right, so um, let me just jump through. All right, so when it comes to, whoops, when it comes to transportation, there are different risks associated with transportation. Things that are outside like bike riding, walking, jogging, hiking, are very low risk for kids and for anyone who's unvaccinated generally. So, so these are things to know. If you're in an Uber or a taxi with a masked driver, again, this is going to be a, considered a low risk. Carpooling uh, with another consistent household, uh, that, we've, that we've talked about this uh, months and months ago in terms of having sort of these bubbles. If you continue with the bubbles, then that's also going to be very low risk. Um, or if everyone's in the car is vaccinated except the, un, uh, the, the unvaccinated kid, then that's also considered low risk. 
it becomes medium risk if we're talking about flying on an airport and going through the, the, the airport and the airplane. Um, carpooling with multiple households, um, even with the windows down and or with the masks. Um, uncrowded mass transit is considered median. So maybe on off hours or whatever on mass transit. Now, high risk would be crowded mass transit, going into a large city and that kind of thing, and incons or inconsistent mask use with others who are around. Those are, those are uh, the different risk levels. When it comes to airport and flying, um, so uh, the, uh, when you look at eating, touching surfaces, so now touching surfaces, we, we really, we, we really uh, learned over time that this is not a big way that the virus spreads. It's mostly through aerosol spread and through through the air, respiratory virus. Um, it's low if, if, if people are, are eating further away from people, say three feet or more away from people. Uh, if the flights and the, uh, if almost if everyone on the flight is masked, uh, then, this is, then this is low. It's medium if people are traveling without masks and it's high if there's a lot of crowded uh, people there, if it's a long flight, if people take their masks off to eat, um, then they're not wearing masks. And so that that's anytime that's the case, then that has a big difference. Summer camp, um, any activities outside, they can be playing and they don't have to wear the masks. So playground or outside recreation time, attending a program with the majority of staff uh, or counselors are vaccinated. Medium, so that's low. Medium uh, risk are outdoor activities in crowded spaces, spaces but it's still outdoor. So for instance, the communal pool, um, relay races, things outside, uh, that's considered medium risk uh, among the kids. High risk are things like attending programs where less than 60% are masked or and or vaccinated or indoor activities like arts and crafts indoors, lunch, et cetera. These kinds of things make it high risk indoors. Um, other extracurricular activities, assuming no masks, Farmer's market, pool, beach, playground, again, very low risk, it's outdoors. Spend as much time outdoors as you can today. Not only is it good, uh, it's good to be burning calories and, and to be spending the time outdoors and enjoying life. Medium risk are outdoor sporting events, concerts, uh, where people have to stand with minimal distance between groups, small sleepover parties, play dates that are indoors. These are all medium risk. High risk, are large sleepover parties with multiple households, indoor birthday parties with lots of kids around, uh, movie theaters are still a higher risk, uh, indoor activities like dance recitals, trampoline parks, other celebrations, or religious observa or observations, or rather observances, high, these are high risk type of activities. Um, assuming no mask, and this is all again, assuming no masks. With the masks, it reduces the risk of all of these activities dramatically. Um, assuming no mask, participation in sports, uh, anything outdoors where there's low contact and it's further away, for instance, baseball, running, swimming in pools, golf, frisbee, these are all very low risk outdoors. Things that are medium risk are indoor low contact sports, so volleyball, dance recitals, cheerleading, gymnastics. Again, if this stuff was outdoor, then it would be a low risk activity. Um, but because it's indoor, then it makes it medium risk. Outdoor close contact sports. So for instance, football, soccer, water polo. So uh, uh, very close contact in the pools, lacrosse, field hockey. These are a little bit higher risk activities for the kids, um, but, but they're still medium overall. However, the highest high risk activities are indoor types of activities. So wrestling, basketball, uh, karate, that kind of stuff. This is more high risk because it's much more close physical contact and if it's all occurring indoors uh, or there's locker room activities that are indoors, then it's considered much higher risk. Um, and so as a whole, this is, this is what we're looking at. Um, do you have any additional questions or is this, is this good for, for now? These are terrific graphics. You always find excellent graphics, Glenn, I have to say. This is there's terrific. a lot of great people doing the work that are making the graphics. So. Well, um, you bring it to us. That's I, what I matters. Just, I'm just the vehicle for showing the great work that other people are doing. You're an excellent teacher and you just, you bring it all to us. You digest it and distill it down to its essence for us. So thank you.
You're welcome. Very, very, very helpful. And you're right, because this is a great way of showing that it's all based on your tolerance, your risk tolerance. There's no one way to answer this question. It's about, well, what's your tolerance for risk? And based on your, the way that somebody answer, answers that particular question, then you can say, okay, low, medium, high. That's how you can choose. So you know, this is you know really what helpful. Like, we, a lot of people are very scared of, of COVID for good reason, but it's also like cancer. A lot of people are very scared of cancer, but cancer is extremely, extremely rare in kids. Cancer is much more common. It's typically a disease of aging. And as people get older, for most cancers, they're more likely to get cancer as they get older. And so as a result, for someone who's 70 years old, they might have a much, much greater risk of getting cancer, having severe consequences, where if someone is seven years old, they simply do not have that same level of risk. And so we can't be scared of the disease for, this, for different people who have very, very different risk uh, um, pro pro uh, profiles. And so it's the same thing with COVID, where someone who's 70 years old is really at much higher risk for COVID severe symptoms, particularly if they have comorbidities and other things going on, whereas most seven-year-olds are going to be at extremely, extremely low risk for COVID severe symptoms. Um, and so as a result, when we're talking about these risk levels, we really have to keep reminding ourselves that... First of all, there are four other coronaviruses in wide circulation that just caused the common cold. And almost all of us got them when we were kids. Probably before we were uh, two years old, we had already gotten these four coronaviruses or some of them. And it just causes the common cold. And it's the same thing with COVID-19 in that the, ma the vast majority of kids who are prepubescent, who are say under the age of 12, um, maybe not the vast majority, but new, many, many of them will be asymptomatic if they get infected. And then virtually all of the rest of them will be just minor symptoms, like cold-like symptoms. That, so they wouldn't even notice if they had it, except for a cold type of symptom that lasts a day or two. Um, there are exceptions, and there are a very, very rare uh, few number of kids with, same as the flu, that, that the flu also put some kids in the hospital every year, but it's very, very rare. With COVID-19, it's very rare. Uh, and some kids who are under the age of 12 will have severe symptoms, either from the acute disease or this MISC, the, the MISC that we've talked about previously that causes some of the severe disease. Um, but it's, it's very, very rare. So when we talk about risk, we really have to balance it knowing that COVID-19 in a 10-year-old or a seven-year-old is nothing like COVID-19 in a 70-year-old. It's just the risk and the severity, the, the disease doesn't look the same. Thank you for, for putting that in, in context. That's really helpful, Glenn. So, so moving from talking about COVID-19 in kids, let's now talk about the other end of the spectrum. Let's talk about nursing homes. We've not talked about nursing homes in quite some time. How are, we do, how are things going in the nursing homes? Are there still infections? And what's the latest? Yeah, so that's a good question. So, so there are still infections going on in nursing homes. Nursing homes have had a really uh, good strategy to vaccinate as many people as they can in the homes, but it's not universal vaccination. There are people who are residents, who, some are who are of whom are refusing to get vaccinated, and some of the staff still aren't fully vaccinated. Um, and so it's still trying to roll that out. We talked a couple of weeks ago about an example in Kentucky. In fact, I can bring it up real quickly if I can find it. Um, well, let me bring it up in a second. First, let me just talk about this, about this slide. Um, so it was earlier on, uh, back in March and April of 2020, so a little over a year ago, um, that the majority of the deaths and severe symptoms were coming from nursing homes around the country. Um, it varied by state, varied dramatically by state. Um, so for instance, New York at first was approximately 40% to 50%. Uh, in fact, I think it was probably closer to 40% um, when it got hit really hard in the first few weeks uh, or, or maybe first few months. But since then, 
uh, the nursing homes have been doing better. However, there's wide variation across the states. Um, so even though the national average is roughly one third, you see that in some states, like here's New Hampshire at 66%, North Dakota at 58%, Minnesota 59%, these are doing very uh, poorly as a percentage. Um, whereas in other states, they're doing much better. Um, if the nursing homes are doing better. That, uh, an, uh, an alternative way of saying this is that a lot of deaths are occurring unnecessarily maybe outside of the nursing homes um, because the nursing homes have the highest risk, but maybe in Texas, for instance, maybe on the fact that only 20% of the uh, deaths are in nursing homes, um, maybe that means that there's other deaths that are unnecessary that were just occurring outside of the nursing homes that they didn't do a good enough job of preventing the deaths in other places. But whatever the reason, um, there is wide variation. One thing when it comes to the Delta variant, let me see if I can pull this up very quickly. This, oh, here, yeah, here it is. Um, so in March of this year, um, there was a, an outbreak in Kentucky. And I think we mentioned this a month or so ago, maybe a couple of months ago. But basically, one person who was a staff member uh, got sick, got infected with COVID-19. That one staff member, they went into the, into the nursing home. And then on the left side, these are all the unvaccinated people. And on the right side, these were the vaccinated people. So despite the fact that all of these people were vaccinated, you still see that 25% of the residents, despite being vaccinated, still got infected from this infected staff person. However, the, the majority of those were asymptomatic. So only 8%, eight and a half percent of the people uh, who uh, were vaccinated actually got symptoms. Unfortunately, because of the high risk of the nursing home, one of the people who was vaccinated, we think that these vaccines are so good and, and they are really amazing, but the vaccines aren't perfect. And that's why we have to keep our, our vigilance up. It's because even though this person was vaccinated, they got COVID-19 and still ultimately died from it. And so the vaccines, when you look at the rates among the unvaccinated people, two people of the, of the unvaccinated, there were very, very few unvaccinated residents there, but this was a quarter, this was 25% of people who are unvaccinated died from this variant. It was, it was likely at this point in Kentucky in March, it was probably the UK variant that was the one circulating uh, back then. Um, but so 25% so died from it, whereas among the vaccinated, only 1.4% vaccinated. So the vaccines were hugely effective, but we're not perfect. And so there's still, we need to protect our elderly. And that's why the vaccines are not enough. And that's why we're almost certainly going to have to bring the masks back in the fall and winter and probably social distancing and this other stuff too. Um, and when you look at the staff, a lot of unvaccinated staff, uh, and remember the staff, just because they're medical personnel doesn't mean that they're physicians and have been uh, really uh, have a lot of training. Some of these people are, nurses who might have had only one year or two years of training and, and they don't realize that they need to get vaccinated. I think the medical staff are working on them to get them vaccinated, but just because they're technically medical staff doesn't mean that, they, that they're that they educated as high as a senior uh, physician or epidemiologist who really knows the science behind this stuff. But so you see a lot of symptomatic uh, uh, people, even among the vaccinated, there were, there were much, much smaller the uh, obviously no deaths. It was uh, uh, not that the age group was a lot less among the, uh, the staff. Uh, the attack rate, the infection rate was 7% among the vaccinated versus 29.6% among the unvaccinated. And the symptomatic rate was only 3.6% versus the 27.8%. So you see it's, it's even, when we look at these, when we talk about these numbers of how amazingly effective these vaccines are, when we talk about 80%, 90% effective, it's accurate what we're saying, but in real life, what that means is that it's 10% or 20% not effective. And that's why come fall and winter, this is going to be an, an issue that we're talking about. But so anyway, here's the map of where we are now. We've gotten a lot better, but we still have some work to do. All right. 
Interesting. We will definitely keep our, our eye on that. That's for sure. All right. So we are Rebecca, getting close. Let, yeah. Let's do, let's, I'm sorry. Let's do two more questions. We started a little bit late. We have a little bit more time and I, I droned on for a while just talking about UK and the world. And there's some really great questions this week. So really, so really good questions. All yeah. right. So let's, you, you want to wrap up with some um, about contact tracing and the, the two new vaccines that are in the works. Shall we, shall we wrap up there? Sure, let's do that. All right. Okay, so take us, take us through your thoughts on, on contact tracing. Was it useful? We haven't talked about contact tracing in quite some time. Was it useful or was it a waste of money? Yeah, those are good questions. And contact tracing, where are you? I think I put it here in last week's. All right, here it is. All right, so we have an answer now about contact tracing. Um, what was the benefit of contact tracing? All right, here it is. So basically, it depends. Um, typically, the here, let me, this is the, the big takeaway here. So there were four types. So this, this study took place. Um, there were four different types of jurisdictions where it took place in terms of how many cases there were, how large the population sizes were that they were looking at this. And what they found, um, let me open up this table just so we can, uh, I can talk about what these are. Um, so basically, location one, location two, location three, location four. Location one had a COVID incident, so a caseload that was the lowest. Location two was uh, was uh, a little bit higher than location one. Location three was around double location two, and location four was at least double of location three. So location one was the was the least number of cases. Location four the most. Okay, generally. So what we found is that let me open this up. What we found is that location one, again, where the caseload was very low, the observed was the dark black line. This is what the contact tracing was, contact tracing was able to deliver. The dotted line was the, were the ranges. So the dashed line was a high estimate of what would have happened without the contact tracing. The dashed line was the low estimate. So it was probably somewhere in the middle. When you compare what somewhere in the middle looks like versus the, solid line, which was actually happened, you see that location one was extremely effective. Location two, similarly, it had some more cases, but not as low as location one. They, oh, and, and by the way, this, these were um, lots of locations that were put into location. That wasn't just one, one place, I believe. Um, this, again, the solid line was what was actually observed after the contact tracing, whereas the dotted lines were what was uh, expected without the contact tracing. So it was still very effective um, in terms of maybe reducing it by a third uh, in terms of that was the effect of the contact tracing. However, when you start getting past a certain threshold, you see that the location three, which had almost double or roughly double the number of cases as a percentage uh, as location two, it had a little, little bit of an effect, but really was not hugely effective. And then when you get into location four, when you just had a surge and it just started getting a lot of people, the, the contact tracing was virtually ineffective. It was basically the other things, the mask wearing, the social distancing, the, the other interventions that were way more effective than the contact tracing. So, so the key takeaway here is contact tracing is very effective when the case spread is low. So for instance, maybe over the summer, contact tracing would be more effective. Whereas in the uh, when we have a surge, then if there's a lot of cases, then contact tracing is not quite as effective. Um, and so when you see the reduction, um, it's, this is what bears it out, that it's really um, the, the less cases, the, the more effective the contact tracing. When there's more cases, the only things that really work are these heavier interventions, requiring mask mandates and, and doing the social, uh, social distancing and whatnot. All right. Yeah. Thank you for taking us through that. Sure. Excellent. All right. So tell us about these new vaccines. There are two new vaccines that have just finished phase three clinical trials. What is going on with those vaccines? What can you tell us? 
Yeah, so it's interesting because at this point we have the mRNA vaccines and Johnson and Johnson. Um, I don't know if I have a slide here. Oh, I think I do. Let me see if I can find it real quickly. So I'm looking at the percentage of vaccines that are J and J. I don't know that I'm going to find it. Let me just look real quickly. Um, going back through the weeks. No, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna find it. All right, so forget it, I'll just speak to it. But basically, so Johnson & Johnson, remember they had the pause. Uh, it was really, really unfortunate pause that they had. Um, and so because of that, um, after the pause, they never recovered. Uh, in fact, let me see, I think maybe the CDC has a proportion. Let me just see, see real quickly, because it was so interesting. Um, here's CDC, vaccines. No, it doesn't say by the um, by the type of by the brand. Anyway, all right. So I'm not going to go into this. But basically, the the key takeaway is that the virtually all of the vaccination in the United States are the mRNA vaccines. Um, Pfizer or not Pfizer, rather Johnson and Johnson um, started off where they were starting to get more. We thought that for a lot of people, just having the one dose shot uh, would be really a better choice for a lot of people who just didn't have time uh, to, to go and get the vaccines or, or for whatever reason, we couldn't count that they would go and get the second vaccine. However, after the pause, it never recovered. And so the Johnson & Johnson vaccine as a percentage of the total vaccines has stayed extremely low. And it's just, it's, it's really not uh, very common. So it's basically the mRNA vaccines that virtually everyone in the United States is getting. Um, and so the question is, well, if there's a new vaccine that's released, even if it's effective, um, would people get it? And I think that there's so much hesitancy, particularly amongst the people who have not gotten the vaccine yet, that I don't think that there's really a market for it right now in terms of bringing it out to the market, particularly for emergency use authorization, possibly for full approval, if it's able to demonstrate that by the fall. So for instance, maybe for a booster shot or something like that, and potentially for outside of the United States. So globally, where there are other vaccines and not mRNA, having the ability to have new vaccine candidates out there would add a huge amount of value for other countries to get vaccinated. So these are the two vaccines that have just become, uh, where we just got some data over the last couple of weeks. The first one uh, just released a couple of days ago. Um, this is CureVac. The CureVac vaccine, unfortunately, so what's interesting about the CureVac vaccine is that it's an mRNA vaccine. So we've talked about Pfizer and Moderna being the mRNA vaccines. So this was put a third mRNA vaccine. And so we, a lot of us had very high hopes for this vaccine. And what we found based on the new results is that it was only 47% effective uh, against severe disease. CureVac, the company claims that the reason it was so ineffective was because of the variants, that it's later to the game. So it had to prove itself based on UK and based on Delta. A lot of us are very skeptical of that. And we just think that, so mRNA is just the technology. It doesn't actually represent the specific uh, vaccine, uh, the, the antigen that it's responding to. And so as a result, uh, it just wasn't as good a vaccine. And so we don't think it's the, the fact that it's the new variants that might have played a small role, but it's probably not. We, I, most of us don't believe that the uh, real impact for the mRNA vaccines is that it's going to reduce efficacy to 47%. Um, but anyway, these were the results. Luckily, it was safe. So again, this was another study. It included 40,000 people. So it's another opportunity to look at safety. And the mRNA vaccine was demonstrated to be safe in these people. But the only reason it's not Pursued, being pursued right now is because unfortunately it was not effective in that people who were um, vaccinated were not getting protected, the, the protection that we needed to see. And so that was the CureVac vaccine. Um, so that, that that's that. The other one that just was released is the Novavax vaccine. This is a more traditional vaccine for what we would typically have 
in flu or other vaccines that are produced. It uses older technology. Um, and Novavax, we've seen great results. Not only is it very safe, but it's also 90% overall effective and 100% protection against moderate and severe disease. And so this is an, another really good uh, potential vaccine candidate, both, like I said, in the United States and abroad. Uh, and so what this means is, again, 93% efficacy against the predominantly circulating variants of concern and variants of interest. This is huge. So that means that uh, presumably, and I, I think I saw the data on this, that there were some people who had the Delta variant and the UK variant, or, or, or not presumably in the same person, but other people had the UK variant, and it was 93% effective against them. Um, and then it was 91% effective in high-risk population. Um, so again, these are great news. Um, the, like I said, because it's new, it's probably not going to get emergency use authorization before fall or winter. Um, the fact that we can start producing it uh, in, in mass quantities, um, I, I don't know what the next steps are here. It probably is gonna pursue full authorization the same way that Pfizer and Moderna are now pursuing full authorization. So it's not just emergency use as we go into fall and winter. Um, that's probably what Novavax is going to pursue. And, um, and so this is just another candidate that we'll have available to roll out to other countries and, and potentially the United States. But it's just great news that it's so effective and, and safe. Wow, those are really impressive statistics, huh? 93%, yep. 91, 100%. Those are numbers we've not seen. Wow. Really interesting. Looking forward to hearing more, particularly about that vaccine and perhaps if booster shots of that vaccine might be available as a mac, uh, mix and match kind of thing, right? Yeah. Anyway. We, you know, we don't, yes. before, let, let me just mention, so for booster shots, we don't know yet whether we're even gonna have booster shots. Right now, the fact that we have, let's say 88% protection with the mRNA vaccines, it's so high, if you were to give a booster shot and it were to only bump it to say 90% efficacy, is it really worth the expense and the logistics of getting everyone revaccinated for just that tiny, tiny incremental gain? So there's a chance we won't get booster shots. However, if we find booster shots that are more effective against the new variants that are arising, or there's additional variants that arise that we're not even talking about yet, then a booster shot might be warranted. So it's still, we don't know yet whether there will be booster shots come fall or winter, but there, there may be, and a lot of people are investigating this right now. Harry, that was your question. Thank you for asking your question and I asked it for you. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that, but Harry, <laughs> thank you for sending that question. I was so excited by those statistics and I just went for the question. <laughs> Sorry about that. And I was also so excited because I'm holding a box here. I hope here, you wait can sec, see let it. Me stop sharing. Try that. Stop sharing. Okay. Can you see? Yeah. Okay. So I'm, ta I'm taking over your Zoom, Glenn. And the reason I'm taking over your Zoom is because you all don't know this, but you're invited to a surprise birthday party because between now and when we're together again on July 11 is our host Glenn's birthday. Oh. And inside this box is a birthday present for Glenn from all of us. And I'm gonna open it so you can see it. And it's in two pieces. Oh, it's a little heavy here. This is the bottom. Oh, wow. And it's the whole world, I'm holding the whole world for you because you've been holding the whole world for us for all this time. Thank you for doing that. And the bottom says, Glenn Grossman, you mean the world to us, uh, your COVID-19 audience. That's, <laughs> that's so That's what great. we're called. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. That's really nice of you. I thank you, everyone. That's great. I really appreciate it. I, you know, I realized what it looks like <laughs> when I was in grad school, when I was doing my doctoral training in epidemiology, a friend of mine asked me how old I was when I was celebrating my birthday. And he said, are you 21 again? 
And before that, I didn't realize that was an option. So every year since then, I've just been 21 again for my birthday. So it's, a, it's a great to celebrate. Anyway. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Glenn. Happy birthday to you from all of us. Your adoring audience, we thank you for everything you've done for us. Happy birthday. We'll be celebrating with you, and we can't wait to be together again. July 11th, mark your calendars. Thanks, everyone. o'clock Eastern time. <clears throat> thank you for everything, Glenn. Thank you. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.